In 1990, Tim Berners-Lee and Robert Calliot proposed a hypertext system, now widely known as HTML, which is considered a step towards World Wide Web as we know it today. Later the same year, in December, the very first web server was set up at CERN. Microsoft broke another record, becoming the first company to note $1 billion in sales for the year, not in small part thanks to its release of Windows 3.0. In the same time, Intel released its portable versions of 386 and 486 CPUs, marking a beginning of soon-to-come notebook craze. If that wasn't enough, in 1990 Hubble Telescope was launched into space, changing what we know about the universe forever. And this is time as good as any to ask you to hit those like and subscribe buttons below. It's just a couple of clicks for you, but helps me more than you know. Thanks! All the general history aside, what we're most keen on here is Amiga though and 1990 brought a lot of very good games to it. Some well-known, often considered either first or best in the series, some so unique that to this day we haven't seen similar titles. And this video will try to highlight a little over 50 of these handpicked gems that were either prominent on the Amiga itself or left a mark on overall history of gaming. So let's get to it. Those of you who have been subscribed to my channel for a while and saw my review of Pro Soccer 2190 may wonder what devil possessed me to have this game end up in this video. After all, we all know that it's beyond trash. Well, like I originally said, not only I believe that it's worst game on the Amiga, but also out of all games on all systems I have ever seen. And that alone secures its place in history, of both Amiga and overall gaming. For those who haven't seen the review, in short, Pro Soccer 2190 is not unplayable, it's downright broken. It makes no difference which direction you move your joystick or if you press fire or not, the game will do whatever it thinks it should, and you can bet your ass it will never be what you think it should do. That is, unless you want it to do some random shit on its own disregarding your inputs. Then it's pretty much spot on. In the end, I don't want to waste any more time on this shit truffle, if you don't believe me saying that it's the worst game of all time, go and watch my review of it. Harley Davidson may have not been the highest scored game upon its release, but it definitely was an unusual one. While you need to get to Sturgis from Maine in 10 days for the famous Sturgis Harley Davidson race, and it's not a short ride, it's not really a racing game per se. It's a mixture of genres and that's why it's so interesting. It's partly a game of the road, where you need to get from point A to point B, avoiding road obstacles and cups. Partly a collection of mini games that you can partake in cities where you refuel your bike at and partly a simplistic RPG slash biker simulation. It's not a game that's easy to categorize, but it's an odd mixture of genres that makes it enjoyable to fire up once in a while and just try to get that bit further living your best biker life. I always like the main title tune that just rocks. Just listen to it whenever you get a chance. And the graphics, they may not be stunning, but they're nice enough not to take you out of the experience. Shadow of the Beast is a trilogy well known for their graphical excellence. There's a pattern within all of them though. Each next game in the series changes appearance of main protagonist to be less beast-like and each consecutive game also improves on the gameplay while reducing graphical fidelity a tiny bit. Shadow of the Beast 2 sits somewhere in the middle. It looks nice, but doesn't play very well. There's plenty of game-ending moments that you won't know of without reading the manual or going through series of trial and error. What's worse, I'm not talking about situation where the protagonist gets killed. No, I'm talking about moments where, for instance, you didn't know that after going from one screen to another, you need to quickly turn back and kill someone who secretly appeared and tries to cut down the rope that's your only way of moving about. It's good looking, but crap playing title. Third one's a good one though, but that's title to appear in a video for another year. Although today it's clear that Castle Master 2 aged badly, with its simple low poly 3D untextured graphics and jerky movement, but back then it was a marvel. A full real 3D game that ran on basic Amigo with as little as 1 megabyte of RAM. On the other hand, Castle Master 2 was also on some 8 bit systems like C64, and while it looked worse there, it actually ran a bit smoother. And that system had only 64 kilobytes of RAM, 16 times less than the Amiga. Anyway, coming back to the subject at hand, Castle Master was an adventure game that as such required completion of many puzzles before the game could conclude in its ending. What's novel about it though is that the puzzles were also based in this 3D environment, which was not something that was done before in any other title. Apart from the release in the very same year, previous installment of Castle Master. World Cup 90 is considered one of the four best football games on the Amiga, the other being Sensible Soccer Series, Kickoff Series and Sierra Soccer. And while it was never as popular as the other three, it was really fun and arcadey title. Kinda similar to Super Sidekicks, as much as the Amiga could pull something similar off that is. 
Personally, unlike most Amiga gamers, I always prefer this and Sierra Soccer to the two most popular, but I suppose it's a matter of preference. It's a fun game if you like the sport and definitely a unique one, as best Amiga football titles tend to settle on top-down view, while World Cup 90 placed its bet on a side view perspective. This viewpoint, however, is perfect for pulling off those impressive bicycle kick goals, so if you know how, it's definitely a rewarding experience to end the match with one of those against a friend. Last Ninja Remix on the Amiga is a 16-bit version of first Last Ninja from 8-bit systems. It caused some confusion back then as on 8-bit machines Last Ninja Remix was a remaster of Last Ninja 2. Still, it is the best outing out of all that appeared on the Amiga. Not in terms of graphics, but playability. The game's played in isometric perspective with 8-way movement. It's a unique blend of exploration, puzzle solving and combat. Attack movements are executed with directional controls and fire button combination for low, mid and high attacks. And there are 5 weapons available, 2 thrown and 3 contact ones. The game plot sees you leading main protagonist to Evil Shogun's Queen Toki's Palace to assassinate him, avenging your ninja's clan in the process. So it's a classic late 80s, early 90s storyline. Ghosts and Goblins given Amiga's capabilities and developers know-how in the 1990 was as good port of arcade original as we could have gotten back then. It may not have been as smooth as the arcade or it might have missed some of the location effects, but in general it was pretty respective and true to original material. In terms of both, presentation that was very close to the arcades and level design and content. So as you can probably guess it was also as difficult as intended. One downside of this conversion though was the fact that you couldn't turn me there, which most games of the time allowed for. I first played DuckTales on C64 back in the day and for the most part Amiga version is the same title but better looking and sounding. According to the story it's all about a competition between you, Scrooge McDuck and your arch nemesis, Flintheart Glombo, who gets most goals within the next 30 days wins. In essence, DuckTales is a collection of four different minigames where you send your grand nephews, Huey, Dewey and Louie to collect as much gold as possible. The stages in Mountains and Jungle are both platforming using different travels and mechanics, the cave stage is a labyrinth and wildlife reservation stage sees one of your grand nephews taking pictures of most unusual and unique animals. DuckTales is not a groundbreaking title, but it's a good example of very decent TV series tying and a fun game to fire up once in a while. Prophecy 1 The Viking Child originally was supposed to be the first part of duology of games heavily inspired by Wonder Boy in Monsterland. Eventually, despite pretty decent reviews, plans for the follow-up were cancelled. The game basically is a platformer with some light RPG elements, like gold collecting, weapons upgrades and ability to visit shops. Viking Child is a title that is a victim to judging by the book cover syndrome, meaning it was a very decent and fun title that was often disregarded among the sea of other platformers, solely based on the quality of its graphics, which to clarify were not bad, just seemed a bit simplistic by 1990 standards. Today, 32 years later, it's considered a hidden gem by many. Jumping Jackson is an unusual arcade puzzle. For one, it's a title that does not reduce its soundtrack to forgettable tune playing in the background. Quite the opposite, it's in the forefront of gameplay. Your task in each level is to collect records and you do so by color matching groups of tiles you jump on. Every time you do, you're rewarded one record. And when you pick them up, they start spinning. Meaning, when first is grabbed, background tune gets the drums. When you grab another, it's bass riffs. And so on. Basically, when you collect all four records in each stage and the background track is completed and playing with all instruments, the level is complete. There are also enemies in the form of various instruments that you have to avoid at all costs as they will reverse your progress. Exalt is an unusual title for many reasons. Firstly, unlike most, it doesn't take place in space or on the overworld of our planet, but in the depths of ocean, which you are told by rather short but atmospheric introduction. Secondly, the game uses a very unusual mechanic of purchasing additional ships, it being a bit different. They act the same way lives do in other shooters. And lastly, between levels, when you purchase set ships in the shops, you can also arm yourself with either one, two or three way shots of increasing power. There are also different secondary add-ons, which can be additional special weapons like missiles or defense items like satellites. Purchases are made with game score and not money, which is also quite novel concept. Over the net is the best volleyball game on the Amiga. Better even than beach volleyball. It may not look or sound as nice, but it feels more strategic and more difficult, but not to the point of being frustrating. Up to four players can play on the same system, but the best mode always was a two-player co-op on the same side. It really shines then as it feels as if you're really part of the team, and as if every play depended on each of both players. It's not a groundbreaking game of no sorts, there's no overly polished graphics or sounds, not to mention special effects. But for what it does, which is play volleyball, does very well. 
Spin Dizzy Worlds is a sequel to 1986's Spin Dizzy, and it's a very unique puzzler. It's set in an isometric view and you're controlling a spinning robotic device called Gerald, which is an acronym for Geographical Environmental Reconnaissance and Land Mapping Device. Your task is simple, to explore and map star system before it's destroyed, while avoiding hazards and enemies and solving simple puzzles, mainly based either on pressing buttons in correct order, navigating paths without failing, or finding all gems. You can move Gerald in 8 directions, accelerate and break, there's no jumps or attacks. Jumping over slopes can only be done with use of ramps. Spin Dizzy Worlds may seem simplistic from my description, but its ingenious and addictive level design makes it a memorable title. Wings of Fury is interesting because it doesn't excel at anything. It's not the best looking game out there, especially not for 1990, it definitely does not sound best, despite having quite a lot of pretty decent samples. And it's not the best gameplay wise. The game gets a bit repetitive quite early, either because you've done all that it has to offer numerous times already, or you're stuck and keep repeating the same thing failing over and over. But while it may seem that I've been dissing the game till now, it's not like that at all. I wanted to highlight that despite being average at best at all individual parts of it, while they're all put together, they make up a very enjoyable and fun little title. Wings of Fury is a scrolling shooter that takes place in the Pacific Ocean during World War II and depicts conflict between the US and Japan. Nitro is a top-down view arcade multiplayer racer. There are quite a few novel for the time concepts in it, for instance ability to progress in lateral levels required having enough fuel which could mainly be earned by placing high enough in earlier races. There is also a shop before each race in which player can purchase nitros, high speed, acceleration and other upgrades, fix their car, change the car itself or refuel it. And since we're on the cars and trucks, there are 3 vehicles to choose from, racing, sports and buggy, and 32 trucks spread over 4 overworlds. Nitro also allows for up to 3 players to play on a single Amiga, 2 on joysticks and 1 on a keyboard, and introduced hectic night races where the whole screen is black apart from small spot lit by car's headlights. I remember stating while recording previous video in the series that there are hardly any good car racing simulations on the Amiga. And yet here we are with Indianapolis 500. Seems my memory is not what it used to be, and to tackle this issue I should have probably researched all the years in advance and not do them all one by one for those videos. But that's a lesson for the future. And while Indy 500 is not a game that ran well on a basic A500, on faster upgraded Amigas it's a charm that looks and plays great. The game offers two peculiar features, namely ability to realistically set up your car for the race and all changes made actually directly affect how it handles. And second, it had a replay mode, which was not a common occurrence in racing games of the time. Ocean's Lost Patrol is a very similar title to Cinemaware's games. In short, it's presentation for days with bunch of mini-games used as means of solving various problems and situations that occur during gameplay. And while it never really reached the Cinemaware standard, it was a very enjoyable and interesting title. You lead a group of US soldiers whose copter crashed in Vietnam and now left with little to no food and hardly any ammo they have to be led to freedom through Viet Cong soldiers' field jungle. Lost Patrol was a unique title that did not glorify war at all, showing that in reality all it really did was bringing pain and distraction, and that there's no real winners in armed conflict. The game's presentation for the time was outstanding, using many various video clips, and while they were short they did leave a lasting impression as it was something that was just not done in 1990. Draken is one of the first few real-time RPGs with full 3D world. The engine uses a mix of 3D vectors and 2D sprites, which is quite novel concept and sorta of midstep between full 3D and still popular back then 2D graphics. While those graphics may not have aged the best, they do kinda have that early 90s charm to them, and personally I don't mind them as much as some of those first early 3D PlayStation 1 titles that look like a hot mess now. Anyway, Draken had a very modern, very Bethesda-esque world design meaning that nearly right from the get-go you could go anywhere in the whole game world. For better or worse, as clearly some areas could mean near instant death to a party full of mobs. While battles are resolved automatically, player can micromanage most aspects of them in real time, making for a unique and fresh approach to the genre. Panzer Kickboxing is one of my few most favorite versus fighting games on the Amiga and also the very best technical fighting game on the system. It offers heaps of various real-life kickboxing moves that you can assign freely to joystick movements with and without pressed fire. All fighters are very smoothly animated and it's a game that requires practice and training to be good at. Approaching it with a mindset of mashing fire with random joystick movements will end in quick failure. 
In Panza, you have to watch your opponent, react to his moves and choose the best attacks for each action. Being able to train and micromanage your fighter was also a nice and welcome touch. Panza Kickboxing is a game that was often overlooked for not sporting odd, colorful and fire spewing characters, for not having explosive and unworldly special moves, but in reality it's a gem that stood tall among many Street Fighter clones being genuinely original and playable. Golden Axe is most likely the best arcade beat'em up conversion on the Amiga. Heck, it's actually probably one of the best games altogether on the system by 1990. Some cuts obviously had to be made to the arcade original, and henceforth sprites and backgrounds lost a bit of color and animation frames, but other than that everything is nigh perfect. All playable characters have been converted, same can be said about all special moves, stages and enemies. And two player co-op is as good as it was at cigarette smoked filled arcades of yesteryear. All in all, it's one of the best conversions of the game to any home system, and any real Amiga fan should do himself or herself a favor and try it out. Cadaver, released by Imageworks and developed by now famous Bitmap Brothers, was in essence a modernized for 16-bit systems night lore. And while high entry threshold and badly aged by today's standards unresponsive controls may discourage from playing, interesting puzzles and many objects to interact with reward the time spent at it. Easy to recognize atmospheric Bitmap Brothers graphics were a definite highlight for the game, even if not as good as in their latter titles. But to be honest, I was never a fan of Cadaver. Lack of shadows often made recognition of how high a certain object displays difficult or even impossible. There are also a few instances where you may progress in the game without being able to ever complete it, because you did or used something where it wasn't necessary. Nuclear War was probably one of the first few satirical strategy games. Come to think of it, I can't recall any other really. I remember some management slash economic games that took that route, like Team Hospital or Lula series, but no other strategy. Feel free to correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. While it may not have been the most complex a very board like in its design, it's really fun and surprisingly addictive. Despite the fact that some outcomes of chosen actions can sometimes feel a bit unpredictable. Anyway, the main goal is to wipe all other nations while surviving the nuclear holocaust yourself. So, in short, to become the ruler of nuclear wasteland. It's not a game that will steal days or weeks from your life like Civilization could, but it's definitely a fun little title for an afternoon. Supercars kinda split the Amiga community. Some swore it was the best out of both games in the series, others say they lacked couch multiplayer, which made it inferior to the follow-up. Personally, I think it's just fine the way it is, and a great first title. Sure, multiplayer is great, but for the first effort it was stellar. Large selection of tracks split between three racing classes, three different cars, vehicle tuning and weapons made supercars an instant classic. The game used top-down view similar to that of Micro Machines, but offered more major teams in similar arcade environments. And while the graphics are simple, they're clear and scrolling super smooth, which makes for enjoyable gameplay. Warlords is an interesting title that has a very Middle-Earth-esque feel to it. It bears quite a bit of resemblance to Heroes of Might and Magic series 2, albeit in much more basic form. You move your heroes on the map and each of them commands an army composed of various fantasy units. The aim of the game is very simple, to drive your chosen race to victory by defeating all other opponents. And you can do it as one of the few staple fantasy races – humans, elves, orcs and dwarves among others. At first combat may seem very basic as it's dice based, but upon closer inspection as you play you'll notice that it's surprisingly deep and takes many other factors in mind, like individual unit statistics, heroes as modifications, artifacts, special abilities and terrain. Worlds is a great game that doesn't look like much, but it's really fun to play. Especially in multiplayer where even up to 8 players can compete for the land on a single Amiga. Midwinter is a mouthful. It's a post-apocalyptic first-person action role-playing game with strategy and survival elements. The game takes place in a far-off future of 2099, where after a catastrophic meteor strike in 2040, in Burma, world was covered in thick layer of diamond dust in upper atmosphere, causing a global cooldown and eventually a permanent winter. All that in turn caused global instability and tumult. The game takes place on a titular island of Midwinter, and you play as Commander John Stark, who has to escape forces of villain General Masters units and recruit civilian and members of military, effectively mounting a guerrilla force out of them to fight the evil General's invasion. The game is quite interesting as it offers many differently specced vehicles and personalities of your potential recruits. Midwinter is too big of a game to describe in full here in few sentences, I'm afraid, so I may need to make a whole review video of it at some point, as it really deserves that treatment. 
Chips Challenge won't win any awards for its graphics, sound or endlessly repeatable music. In fact, its presentation is pretty basic, nowhere near the standard for 1990. But that's totally irrelevant. Because 148 levels of pure puzzling magic that it offers makes up for it in heaps. Funny enough, originally Chips Challenge was released for Atari's failed Lynx console, widely considered a potential console seller. But it was other systems where it gained its fame and popularity on. In theory, all you have to do in each level to progress to the next is collect enough chips to open the chip socket at the end of it. In practice, there are sets of rules that apply for each kind of levels, and there are a few of these. Some are more action, quick reaction based, others rely solely on puzzling, but most use the time limit. Despite what it may look like at first glance, the amount of puzzles and addictiveness will keep you glued to the monitor for hours on end. If you thought that I'd let 1990 pass without mentioning Cinemaware game, you were wrong. And while Ant Heads may not be as innovative as it came from the desert was a year earlier, it's still a very good follow-up. Sure, it transformed borderline believable story of ants growing huge in size into more surreal people mutating into Ant-Man hybrid, but other than that it was still good old cinema or interactive movie story that we've all grown to love. Since most of the presentation was reused from the previous game and it required some of the discs from original, it could be considered more as an extensive expansion rather than a completely new game. But that's just my 5 cents on the subject. Certain small elements were changed for Ant Heads, like a protagonist that's now a completely different person, and a game moved slightly more towards action-based sequences. Champions of Kryn is SSI's first in the famous Gold Box series of AD&D RPG games. And if you're playing it on the Amiga, you're playing the best version that there is. The game is widely considered a staple of computer RPG games and one of the most important titles in history of gaming. The plot follows your party's quest of finding the evil Mirtani and defeating him along with his evil forces. That's the short of it. At start of the game you have to create your party of up to 6 adventurers, all staple AD&D races and professions, and if they survive the story of the game they can be imported in the follow-up, Death Knights of Kryn. Unique feature of Champions of Kryn was the fact that while the Traveler was in first person, 90 degrees turning tile based mode familiar to gamers back then, combat encounters took place on a flat top down view plane where each player's character was controlled individually in turns. And while all gold box games may be a bit difficult to stomach for a current modern player, there are no doubt important titles in their genre. Wizardry Bane of the Cosmic Forge is the sixth title in the long running Wizardry series of RPG games first and only release on the Amiga. It was also the first title in the Dark Savant trilogy that sadly never saw any other releases on the Ami. It is a standalone experience though, so lack of follow-ups is not a game-breaking issue. While creating a party of up to 6 adventurers, you can pick from 11 races and 14 professions, so there's a lot to mix and match here to customize the party per your liking. There are also 6 schools of magic and 3 categories of various skills. It's clear that David Bradley, the designer, spared no effort to create a deep, interesting and customizable RPG. Story-wise, you enter an abandoned for over a hundred years castle in search for the Cosmic Forge, a mythical pen that is set to control destiny, time and space and anything written with it instantly becomes true. Wizardry is a full-fledged dungeon-crawling RPG that's worth revisiting even today. Dragonflight is a direct port from Atari ST, so there's no enhancements whatsoever and the graphics state at basic Atari's 16 colors. That said, as I've mentioned not once, it's not the graphics that make the game, and Dragonflight is a very good game indeed. Probably one of, if not the best, RPG on the 16-bit Atari. It's not the best on the Amiga, but definitely one of the better and more memorable ones. Most unique thing about it is its perspective trifecta, as I'd like to call it. And what I mean by that is that when you're traveling on the overworld, the game draws the picture in overhead Ultima style to the view. This way you have a good view of the wide area surrounding your party. The dungeon crawling is in typical and popularized by Dungeon Master first-person 3D perspective with tile movement. And last but not least, any battles with enemies take place in a tactical side view with grid unit placement and turn-based combat. Dragonflight is pretty open-ended so that you won't have to rush to the end and have no set path of adventuring. Street Rot is a very unusual and unique racing game. Everything about it is great, but the racing. Sounds odd? Well, in essence, all the game features apart from the races themselves are very enjoyable. Races, while not the worst, are meh at best. The main attraction here is the fact that in Street Road you buy your own cars, win races and then use the money won on upgrading the hot rods, which requires disassembling and putting back together all necessary parts. No other game at the time allowed for such freedom of tinkering and changing cars performance to such a degree, and not many since. 
pity though that the racing, so the main fare of the title, was not the best. In this, however, it reminds me of my beloved Fallout. Most of the games in the series I loved, but then came Fallout 4. And while it was really fun post-apocalyptic shooter, it was a terrible Fallout and not an RPG at all. Same here, great game, not a very good racer. These days games like Sega's Football Manager got us used to infinite amounts of tables, numbers, rankings, schedules, stats and such. An ocean worth of data. Back in the day management games were simpler and more based on developers' imagination or observations rather than the actual real-life stats. And that's what the World Championship Boxing Manager is. Simple at first glance, yet surprisingly deep and addictive boxing management. In fact, it's probably the best boxing management game that I've ever played. Partly because there isn't that many of these. But also it's a really good title if you like those kinds of games, that is. You're responsible for everything, from scouting new talent through training and assignment of various tactics, to arranging fights. It's a really fun game. Kickoff 2 is considered the best game in the whole series that spanned 14 years and released on multiple systems. Dino Dini, a designer and coder, improved on previous titles formula by adding replays, saves and ability to partake in the World Cup. It may not seem like much, but there wasn't much to fix really. Same as predecessor, however, Kickoff 2 has a very steep learning curve, meaning players lacking time or will to persist will most likely bounce off it and settle for other, more streamlined games like Sensible Soccer. Supremacy, also known as Overworld in the US, is a strategy game where your goal is to create and protect a network of planetary colonies and defeat computer-controlled adversary who's doing the same. Before colonizing, planets need to be terraformed and you also have to make sure to provide enough food and energy to colonists who inhabit those. In time you'll need to start building planetary defenses and attack battle cruisers. Supremacy, while not being overly complex, provides very enjoyable gameplay loop and even though it's not as demanding as some latter strategies on AmigaWare, it's plenty entertaining for an afternoon of gaming. While the character of Elvira was a comedic B-movies persona, Horrorsoft's Elvira Mistress of the Dark is truly dark and campy horror role-playing game. Actress Cassandra Peterson reprised her role for the video game and it's something that was not very common for the time. The game itself follow up on the events of the 1988's film of the same title. You, as a player at the beginning of the game, are captured by the Wicked Witch Emelda's minions and shortly after rescued by Elvira, who in turn asks for help in getting back her powers. The title is a mixture of first-person role-playing with point-and-click adventure game elements. It was a very well-received and universally praised for its gruesome atmosphere, excellent graphics and disturbing good and dark soundtrack. While nearly everyone seems to believe that the combat sequences could be considerably improved. In terms of story design, Captive is probably one of the most unique and ingenious games of the 90s. The main protagonist named Trill is judged and found guilty for a crime he did not commit. His punishment? 250 years in space cryogenic prison. 248 years later he wakes up with amnesia, not knowing who or where he is. And since his cell has been long doubling down a storeroom, he found a briefcase computer in it. Turns out it can be used to control a group of four droids. From this point onward he has to use the droids to scoop the vast space looking for himself and finally gain back freedom. Captive is a sci-fi role-playing game with first-person view akin to Dungeon Master, where you lead a set for droids. Throughout the game you visit many bases, shops, will you utilize various weapons and devices, all to complete your mission. The game became infamous for two things. Difficulty level that very quickly ramped up, and game breaking back in form of missing codes in two of the missions that halt progress. And I'm gonna do you a solid and show them on the screen. Powermonger is a real-time strategy built upon the engine used in Populous. The goal of the game is simple. On each map, and there are over 250 of these, you must capture most cities and defeat enemy captains. Captured cities can be used to draft units to armies, and you can have as many armies as you have the captains to lead them. Most unique, although often overlooked feature of Powermonger is its artificial life engine. That simulates the life of each and every person on the map, and they go about their daily lives without players' input. So they work, fish, farm, collect wood or make items. A year later Bullfrog released expansion for Powermonger that took place during First World War and was as well received as the base game was. When I first saw Punk on the Amiga at my friend's house, before I even had my A500, I felt a sudden spiky and uncontrollable pain around my temple. And it grew and grew and in a matter of seconds it was beyond control and then boom, it popped and my mind was blown. 
Punk was not an arcade-like game, it was THE arcade game. Seeing it in his home, I honestly couldn't tell any difference from the arcades without direct comparison, apart from the fact that I didn't have to keep dropping coins in the machine. The conversion is beyond perfect. Everything is included from all the stages and pickups through two-player on-screen co-op to addictive one more try gameplay. The premise is simple and easy to pick up, but soon the levels get more and more challenging and the game itself ends up being difficult to master. It's a perfect arcade title. Silent Service 2 is my most favorite submarine simulation on the Amiga and a follow-up to the 1986 Silent Service. Simply put, it's more of the same but better. So, the graphics have been considerably improved, controls have been streamlined and made more user-friendly, and the game overall feels more modern, where you spend less time looking where to do something and more time actually doing it. The game takes place on the Pacific Ocean, where you can either take part in historical battle, single random scenario or play out a whole career. Silent Service 2 found itself in a very elusive sweet spot where it's deep and engaging enough to keep you glued to the screen for hours on end, in the same time easy to comprehend and control so you won't need to read book sized manual to enjoy it. While Star Control 2 is universally considered one of the best and most important titles in the history of gaming, it was never released on the Amiga. We did however get first Star Control, which was a completely different game. In essence, it's a simple space-based strategy game with combat encounters resolved in real-time duels between ships of various sizes, weaponry and stats. It's very similar in this mechanic to older 8-bit title, Arkham. It's not set in medieval high magic times and it's not played on a board, but other than that uses identical concept. It's A-OK -okay to this end game alone, but shines in couch multiplayer duels however. So if possible, play it with a friend. Player Manager, as the title suggests, was probably the first and to this day one of the very few games that combined management and single player football so that you could do both. It used first Kickoff's engine as a base and to this day it's fondly remembered by those who played it. You start in the third division and have to make your way all to the top. Some changes were made to the league's size as compared to real life, so top two leagues had 10 teams each and the bottom had 12. Apparently it was caused by memory constraints, but since other games had no such issues, I'd risk saying it may have been caused by particularities of the game engine. It's an interesting title that most Amiga football fans knew and appreciated. Most don't usually associate Cinemaware with sport titles, but here it is. TV Sports Basketball by the Amiga's Masters of Interactive Movie Adventures. And it's freaking awesome. Some would argue that not only it was the best basketball game on the Amiga for the time, but even one of the best to this day. The in-game perspective is from the half-court. Whenever a player crosses the half-court line, animation cuts in place showing them run and then it switches to a post-half view. Other than the usual Cinemaware's outstanding presentation, the game rose above others with few novel ideas. You could choose, for instance, if you wanted to play as just the one same player or switch to the one that has ball at hand. And most importantly, you could edit the players recreating the teams or even the league of your dreams. If you've never played it, it's high time you give it a shot as it really deserved the praise it got over the years. Everyone knows Prince of Persia, or at least everyone should. Not only on the Amiga, but as a mm. title in history of gaming in general. For those who for whatever reason don't, I'm happy to explain. It's a 2D platformer released for all 16-bit computers and video game consoles of 1990. It's a game that stole hearts of many with its excellent level design, gripping puzzling and fights, and a time limit of only 60 minutes to complete it, meaning hardly anyone ever playing it for the first time managed to do so. But while all this glued everyone to screens for hours, what made everyone go wow were the graphics. Prince of Persia was a king, really bad pun intended, of rotoscoping animation, making it more fluid and lifelike than any other game had been before. Their finest hour is Lucasfilm Games' take on World War II Battle of Britain. It's a flight combat simulation, not to mistake for combat flight simulation. The distinction is subtle, but in short, it means that it focuses on combat simulation rather than on the flight part of it. I mean, you do fly, but there's no taking off or landing and it just feels a bit basic. But that's irrelevant, because what it does, it does great. And that's combat. You're in full control of all available aircraft, meaning that when you're in a bomber, for instance, you can actually man all crew positions yourself. So it's up to you alone to succeed or fail in missions given. And since we're on the subject, there was also a neat mission builder included, making their finest hour infinitely playable. And you could even record the combat films of your encounters for future viewing. It was a game truly ahead of its time. 
Dragon Wars is a fantasy role-playing game made by now famous for the Fallout series Interplay. The game is your typical first-person perspective role-playing with some interesting tweaks and changes. For instance, your party can have up to 7 characters at any given time, and this can be chosen freely out of any of the starting characters, recruited characters and even summoned creatures. What's more, when you start a game you can either pick the default starting 4, create your own starting 4 or import them from Bard's Tale Trilogy. Yes, that Bard's Tale, a whole entirely different game Bard's Tale. Anyway, the plot is quite novel too. The magic was outlawed and you and your party are imprisoned for life on a suspicion of spellcasting. And armed with nothing but your wits and magic, you have to get out. While Conquests of Camelot is probably Sierra Online's best point-and-click adventure on the Amiga, the port leaves a lot to be desired. It's clearly moved straight from PC without much care, so instead of beautiful and colorful Amiga graphics, it's showered in terrible 16-color EGA PC palette. It doesn't use any of the Amiga's specialized chips either, so action sequences, even if sparse, are a bit jerky to say the least. Thankfully, the story of Camelot's love triangle, missing Knights of the Round and your quest playing as King Arthur to find them in the Holy Grail is top notch. It's interesting, filled with surprises and chock full of great puzzles, some even with few alternate solutions. All fans of adventure games would love it despite the few mentioned shortcomings and most real Amiga fans should at least have a go at it. Created by the legendary Sid Meier, Railroad Tycoon is as good of a game as you'd expect from this rightfully famous designer. And even though, as with most of his games, it did not offer much in terms of presentation, it over-delivered in gameplay. The complex yet incredibly addictive mechanics and steep but fair learning curve made Railroad Tycoon an instant classic, upon its release, not only today. It's one of those games that can be played repeatedly and near indefinitely. But what it is, you may wonder. If title hasn't given it away yet, it's a business simulation game where you're responsible for micro and macro managing of your own railroad company. From laying tracks and purchasing engines through expansion over the map to finally becoming the titular tycoon. Railroad Tycoon saw the deluxe version released three years later and a whole series of games based on it released until 2006. Lotus Spirit Turbo Challenge 2 was arguably the best arcade racer on the Amiga. This is not the game. This is the first part. And while it may not be as classic as universally loved and fondly remembered, without it we wouldn't have the king. And many of the things that made the second game so great originated here. It's super smooth and fast, very arcadey without being unfair, and enjoyable in everything it has to offer racing-wise. It's also clear from ground up that Lotus was designed as two-player versus game, as the screen is divided in half horizontally. So even if you play alone, the half of the screen that your opponent would be on is covered. With neat and flashy graphics, but still not used for anything at all. It's not a biggie, but something that was definitely fixed in the latter title. Keeping all that in mind, it's worth pointing out that if not for Lotus 2, this would probably be a very strong contender for the best arcade racer on the Amiga. Funny enough, the thing with Terrican here is quite similar to previous title in the video, Lotus. This too is an amazing, incredible and generally beloved by Amiga's community title that's also shadowed by its much better and improved second outing. And also as with that one, we wouldn't see a follow-up without the first game. Oh well, such is life. Anyway, Terracon is Metroidvania as we would have called it now, so a shooter-platformer hybrid that's viewed from the side and focused on fast and frantic action, with hundreds of enemies out to get our main protagonist and many, many weapons and power-ups. The game was designed by Manfred Trentz, a mastermind behind the first two games in the trilogy, and ported to everything under the sun, 8 and 16-bit computers and most capable consoles of the time. It was a commercial and critical success. Perhaps not as big one as the Terracon 2, but one nonetheless. Toasty! Might and Magic Book 2, Gates to Another World, is New World's computing second in the long-running series of Might and Magic RPGs, that were very popular at the time and spawned even more popular and beloved series of Heroes of Might and Magic. Still, this being the second title allowed for importing of your party of 6 from the previous game or creating a new one. In fact, you could create up to 24 characters and those not used would be spread all over the game world in inns where they could be hired, as your in-game party of 6 allowed for 2 additional hirelings for a total of 8 characters. This extra 2 would be controlled like the initial 6 but required daily payments and cost rose with their level. Quite a novel concept for the time. It's not the only one though. The game offered 255 different kinds of monsters, you could enhance your gear of up to plus 63, unlike Dungeons and Dragons where plusing ceiling was around plus 4 or 5, and battles could involve theoretically even up to 255 opponents at once. The game was huge, and this along with very unique for the series atmosphere made it so fondly remembered to this day. 
And I just realized I said nothing about the story, but given limited time I have for this video, all I say is that it's worth playing even today. Sid Meier's Pirates. Yep, well, I could end it here really. And I'm sure most would know everything that I would like or could say about it. But most is not all. So, if I was to choose one person that changed the whole world of gaming by designing constantly more ingenious titles in plethora of genres, while creating some of them in the process, it would have to be Sid Meier. The man's a genius. Anyway, Pirates is a game of many things. It's an action-adventure with role-playing elements, pirate fleet management overtones and all that sprinkled with good old strategy bits. It's a true gem. And if I was to simply summarize it in short, I'd say it's a game where you live your best pirate life. It gets you so involved in that lifestyle that you quickly forget of real world and just go on your merry way swashbuckling hunting treasures, defeating forts, sinking fleets worth of ships and capturing cities. All in the pursuit of the loot, aka the big whoop. And your long lost family. If that sounds interesting to you at all, check my full review of it on this very channel. I talk about it in more or less 10 minutes worth of detail there. Which, while still not enough to give pirates justice, it's much more in depth than here. Speedball 2 Brutal Deluxe is easily one of the best free sports games on the Amiga. And it's not even a real sport. Ice cream, ice cream. Anyway, it's a mixture of handball with ice hockey that rewards violent and aggressive play clearly drawing inspirations from 1975's The Roller Bowl. The game is played by two teams of nine players as opposed to five in previous title, on an enclosed pitch with a goal at each end. And the goal is to amass the most points possible throughout the whole match. Goals are worth 10 points initially, but that can be raised with multipliers to 15 or even 20. There are also targets on sides of the court that reward bonus points, and you naturally also get points for injuring opposing players. Each match lasts 180 seconds, and there are 5 different game modes available. Knockout, Cup, League, Practice and Multiplayer. It's pretty obvious that the most fun in Speedball 2 comes from Couch vs Multiplayer, where you compete against your real-life friends. Or enemies, I'm not the one to tell you who to spend your time with. In the end, the game was a huge success and has a cult following to this day, with some people swearing that it was their most favorite sports game. Wings is another brilliant gem of a game released by Cinemaware. The further we go in years of Amiga gaming series, the more sad I get knowing that the studio of designers of such talent and capabilities is no more. But it is what it is. So, Wings is another of those interactive movie mixed genre titles with arcade, simulation and adventure type elements all mashed together seemingly on random, but in the end coming out as a magnificent game. It takes place in the World War I era, and while being as atmospheric as all other cinema titles, Wings is more action oriented. So while following the story you'll be dogfighting with enemy planes, bombing targets and flying in strafing sections. And even if it's not as story heavy as the previous games were, it's incredibly fun and addictive and one of the most memorable experiences on the early 90s Amiga. In the last video I swore that I'd do my best to keep them shorter and more to the point. That I would skim through the games and only pick the most important and the best and most memorable ones. And here we are, in this behemoth of a video. But you know what? I did. I went through my initial list of titles multiple times and I've dumped so many great games from it you wouldn't believe. More than once. So, while I couldn't keep the video at the more reasonable length, in fact it's much longer than the previous ones were, I think I did a good job. Cause if I stuck to what I started with, this would be over 2 hours. And because of that I'm making no length promises on the next one. If you liked the video please smash that like button. And if you don't mind hit that subscribe as well. It's click here and there for you but helps me a lot. And if you're in a more generous mood, you can consider joining my Patreon. Patrons get access to new videos a day early and there are also other benefits. But you do you. All I'm saying is that it would help me make better content, replace some bits in my aging editing rig and maybe even get a camera. Who knows. For this video however, this is all. So have a good one and I'll see you next time. Peace.